All right. Well, if you brought your Bible with you, open up to Romans 11, where we're going to be today as we continue through our year-long series in the New Testament book of Romans, taking it about a paragraph at a time to help us understand uh, why this book changed the world and then why it can change our lives as well today. Romans as a book has sort of four major sections in it. Today we come to the close of the third big chunk, chapters 9 to 11. Um, and this is the part of the book that uh, a lot of people kind of get bogged down in or get confused by. So congratulations to, to reach the end of maybe the most challenging section of Romans today. Chapters 9 to 11 address the question, if God is really so faithful and really so good as the gospel describes, why did a Jewish Messiah take root with a non-Jewish population and not with the people he came from? Put a different way, if Jesus was really Jewish and he was really the hope of the people of Israel, why did the people of Israel largely not embrace him in Paul's generation or in ours? And why did he become more popular with non-Jewish Gentiles than with the people of Israel himself? And we've been talking about that over the last number of weeks. And here in the last part, Paul is going to talk not just about the present, but about the future for Israel and the hope that all of us can look forward to. This passage has drawn a lot of uh, a lot of debates over church history, a lot of arguments. Maybe for some of you, you were part of Christian communities maybe a generation ago in the 70s or 80s where there was a lot of uh, political baggage sort of put on these verses. And as a result of that, um, sometimes they're ignored by Christians. But they're there for our benefit and they're there for our good. And um, I think as we get through this next 25 minutes, 30 minutes together, they'll be there to help us in our faith as well. I did want to mention one thing that we added this week. Uh, kids... On the back of the bulletin, there's kind of a, an exercise for you. If you hear me say five of the ten words on there and you circle them, afterwards you can stop by with Pastor Jason at the welcome table and get a treat. Uh, so listen to the sermon, pay attention as you hear those words be said. You can circle all of them. What does it mean to be a kid? I'll leave that to your parents' discretion. If your parents aren't here and you drove yourself, <laughs> you're not a kid. You're not a kid, all right? You're someone's kid, but you're not getting the candy, all right? All right. What do you wish you could know about the future? What do you wish you could know about the future? Maybe for some of you, it's you know where you'll get into school or what you'll do for your career or who you'll marry. Maybe for some of you, it's about your health. Maybe you, you just really want to know what, what's going to happen with your health or how you're going to die or something like that. Uh, maybe for some of you, it's, it's circumstantial. You really wish you could know how things are going to play out in your favorite hobby or in the election in the fall or in the election four years from now. You, you, you just you want to know something about the future. What do you think you would become like as a person if you found that out? How do you think knowing the future would shape or reshape your character? Now, if you've watched many American movies about uh, knowing the future in the last generation, you've been warned that, that knowing the future will make you either self-indulgent, like Biff from Back to the Future, right? Then he becomes kind of a glutton. Or it'll make you a, a risk to the universe, right? That's what Marvel told us about knowing the future. Now, today's passage is going to say something different. Though. It says that if you really knew what God was doing and will do in the future, it wouldn't make you gluttonous or despairing. It wouldn't make you a risk. But actually, it would make you humbled before God. That's what would happen to your heart and to my heart. That rather than the future intoxicating us, the Bible tells us it should have the opposite impact on us. It should sober us and humble us and help us to see clearly the faithfulness and goodness of God. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about the mystery of Israel's future and what God uh, is at work in, how God is at work in them. And then he's going to, Paul's going to make the bridge there from talking about Israel's future to talking about what their salvation tells you about your own salvation. And then lastly, we're going to sort of close with Paul's exclamation of humility and worship at the end of the passage. So let's get into it. Romans 11, verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, which is kind of a fancy way of saying, so that you don't get to be so full of yourself, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. Right? This, is, this is where I'm drawing from this, the idea, Paul's saying, if you really know what God was up to, it wouldn't make you think more of yourself, but it would make you think more of God. Instead of being wise in your own sight, I want you to see what God is doing in salvation history, brothers. He calls this a mystery. Now, mystery in American culture is 
usually refers to you know books or movies or TV shows where you think along with the writer or along with the characters, if I was just a little smarter, I could have noticed everything and pieced this together myself. If I was just like Sherlock Holmes, if I was just like Dr. House, if I was just like whoever, I would have, I would have figured this out with them. And some of them, you feel like, I, I, I got it. I, I knew who, who killed the guy in Law and Order. I figured it out, right? But that's, that's not how mystery is used theologically. When you see the word mystery in the New Testament, it shows up a lot in Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, here in Romans. It's Paul telling us, God has hidden something until a certain place in salvation history in which he unveiled it. It was a mystery until God made it clear. You couldn't have figured it out. No one could have figured it out. But God has made it known. These things may have always been there in the Old Testament. Augustine had this great metaphor. He said the Old Testament is like a room with furniture in it that's pitch black. And you can sort of feel your way around, but until the light was turned on, you didn't really notice how the room was decorated. Right? It's the same sort of thing, right? The furniture was always there, but, but until the light was turned on of Christ, we, we couldn't have figured it out. And Paul says, that in the same way, there's a mystery that of God's unveiling, his unfolding of his plan of salvation. And here's the content of that mystery in verse 25. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all of Israel will be saved. These couple sentences sound short, but they've yielded a lot of debates. Like, what does it mean that all Israel will be saved? Or what does it mean for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in? Or what does it mean that there's been a partial hardening upon Israel? How do these things work together for God's glory and for your good? And, and what do we make of all of them? Before we get into some of the debates that have happened over the last couple thousand years, I want to mention something sort of below the surface you might not have noticed, which is, you know, the assumption that Paul is, is turning on his head is the assumption that many of his contemporaries had. You know, you'll see this in the Gospels sometimes. The assumption was, you know, God is going to bless the Gentiles through the greatness of Israel. That was Paul's generation's assumption. If we'll just redeem all of Israel, we'll make Jerusalem great again, we'll make them rich, we'll make them powerful, uh, we'll make them in control, then the Gentiles will be blessed too. They'll sort of get secondary benefits. We'll make, God will make Israel great again through the Messiah, and then that will result in benefits to the nations. That was the assumption of Paul's day. But Paul points out, that's not what God has done. God did not bless the Gentiles secondarily by making Israel great. Instead, God's done the opposite. He's, he's elevated the Gentiles in order to be a blessing to Israel. It's not the, the Gentiles are made jealous of the Jews and they flock to Zion to pay them homage, as one writer said. It's the Jews who have become jealous of the Gentiles. I think that's worth pointing out because a lot of Christians today assume that God works by, you know, if he would just bless me, then I could be a blessing to others. If he would just make Christians powerful or if he'd just win celebrities to Christ, imagine, you know, if Michael Jordan could just become a Christian, what a great testimony he would have. And that doesn't seem to be how God does things, right? Instead, he chooses the weak among the world to shame the strong. Right? All right, well, let's, let's talk about the debates here. What does it mean that all of Israel will be saved? This is a controversial issue for a whole host of reasons. Some of those are interfaith reasons between Jews and Christians and the legacy of 2,000 years of discord and at times persecution, shamefully. It also is a controversial issue because we're talking about the future. We're talking about eschatology and we're talking about end times things and there's a lot that we don't know that we're speculating about. And then on top of that, it's a complicated thing because it tends to touch on politics and geopolitics at that. Um, and so if you find yourself kind of guarded against this passage, being like, Bob, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about Israel being saved. I, I, don't, I don't want to be one of those guys who has like the end times chart in my room and I'm like kind of connecting dots or getting on message boards. Do they still have message boards? Getting on Twitter um, and arguing about these things. I, I just, I don't want to talk about that. I get it, right? I get, I get that. I, I can understand that mentality. But remember what verse 25 said? This is in here to keep you from becoming wise in your own eyes. This, this is for your good and for my good as well. So the goal is not to make us think that we're smarter than other people or better than other people or whatever, because we understand this, but it's actually to, to humble us and to see the faithfulness of God. So let's talk about what it means that all Israel will be saved, and we'll, we'll take the words sort of one at a time in reverse order. What does it mean for Israel to be saved? 
Let me start with what it doesn't mean. Paul is not talking about geopolitics. He's not talking about the um, rescuing of a nation state or of a government, right? There's a few reasons for that. One is Paul doesn't seem to be interested in talking about Israel as a nation state because it didn't exist as a nation state in his generation. It was a people, not a country, if we can put it that way. Secondly, it doesn't fit with how Paul has talked about salvation all throughout Romans. I mean, you guys know this. How does Paul talk about salvation? He talks about every person being a sinner who is separated from God as a result of the sins they've done and the things they've left undone, as well as their inherited sin from generations before that. That all of us individually need to place our faith in Christ as our Savior. And as a result of placing our faith in Christ, that we experience salvation now and we will be saved one day in the future. He's saying that's what Israel, the people of Israel, need to experience. So this is not a, a statement that says, as a result of this, we can be confident that Israel will always win the Seven Days War, or they'll always win the fight against Hamas, or any sort of geopolitical um, proclamation that people might make. Instead, Paul puts the emphasis on the need for salvation from sin. That's what he says in verse 26. He quotes, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And then, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Right? This is not about their, their political enemies or their geopolitical rivals, but instead their need for salvation from sin. So that's the salvation that Paul's describing that needs to come to Israel. Then the question is, who, who does he mean by Israel? Like, what, what people does he have in mind? Now, some of the reformers, uh, John Calvin among them, said, well, when he says Israel here, when he says all Israel would be saved, he's just using that term metaphorically to refer to the people of God, which the people of God are people who put their faith in Christ, and so he's saying everyone who puts their faith in Christ will be saved. Okay, I mean, I guess that gets you out of any sort of prophecy debate or discussion. It's kind of an easy way out on that one, but it's not how Paul uses the word Israel anywhere else in the section. He's been talking repeatedly about Israel and the Gentiles and the Gentiles being provoked, uh, the faith of the Gentiles being provoked by, sorry, the jealousy of Israel being provoked by the faith of the Gentiles. It would seem really hard-pressed to say how that could happen if Israel was referring to the church, so that doesn't make any sense. Another option would be to say, well, everyone who lives in the modern nation state of Israel, and that, if that's your view, that makes for some really interesting books and novels. Like, everyone who lives in this certain span of, of the world will one day come to faith in Christ. Read my exciting novel for how it happens, now available at your Christian bookstore, if those still exist. And again, a lot of people have written a lot of books that sort of advocate that view. The problem, again, the nation state of Israel didn't exist at the time. Also, Paul was writing to Jews in Rome, not people who lived in Judea. So that doesn't seem to be his argument. Uh, to my opinion. He could be talking about everyone who descended from Jewish lineage, who came from a Jewish grandparent or parent. And this seems to be more consistent with what Paul's talking about within the book of Romans itself. But even then, Paul made the point in chapter 9 that not everyone who came from the people of Israel are Israel. Remember that? From a few weeks ago. So what do we do with all this? Well, uh, let's, let's try to piece it together for a second. There was a minority of Jewish people who had already responded to Christ in Paul's day, and Paul anticipates that some portion of, at some point in the future, the remaining majority would go from being hardened toward the gospel to responding favorably to Christ as well. Maybe not every single person who comes from a Jewish background, but a large uh, and sizable majority of them. That's what Revelation 7 seems to describe. This seems to still be in the future for us. We've never seen that happen in 2,000 years, but we can trust that God is good and that he is at work and faithful to his covenants and faithful to his people. When will it happen? Where will it happen? How will it happen? Uh, that's a mystery. But the open nature, open-ended nature of this topic leads us not to sort of speculation in a way that makes much of us, but it makes much of God. And we should live in the relationship with our neighbor in a way that's loving and gracious towards them. All right, but if you want to send me your end-time prophecy charts, you can totally do that, and I would love to talk about it with you. Because I, I, I think that while my generation of, you know, sort of millennials and, and those after me have kind of ignored this topic that was more popular in the 70s and 80s, dispensationalism and, and that, we've kind of done it at our peril, right? There, there is something really important to our faith of hoping and trusting that God will be faithful to his people. 
In this next section of the passage, Paul wants us to see that connection, this, why this is good news for even the Gentiles, making this connection between our future, Israel's future salvation and our salvation as well. So Paul's going to tell his reader here that they, they may see Israelites as their enemies because they're opposed to Christ, but that's not how God sees them. Look at verse 28. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Paul wants us to see that just because we're opposed to someone doesn't mean God is opposed to them, right? Just because even they're opposed to Christ doesn't mean that God is opposed to Israel. God is faithful even when people are opposed to him. It's an amazing statement about God's faithfulness and God's character. Unfortunately, verse 29 is often taken wildly out of context, not at all talking about God, but talking about us and our privileges. By the time you'll hear verse 29 the most often, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable, is when Christian leaders have done something they shouldn't have done morally, and they've been caught, and then they want to get another job working at a church. They say, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. So even though I robbed a bank while high on heroin with a stolen car, I should go back to being a pastor two weeks later. Right? The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. If you're ever in church leadership and someone says that to you after they've done something they shouldn't do, just give them a copy of 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, pepper spray them, and tell them to go work at Trader Joe's for a while. Um, the pepper spray's optional. I just, uh, it's, it's just... All right, I, that's not what the passage is about, but because it's misunderstood that way or it's misapplied that way, I just want to, I, I want to inoculate you guys against that view, right? To say the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable doesn't mean that someone who works in ministry should always get another job in ministry after they've behaved badly. What it means is that God is faithful and that he is not going to give up on his people, not about what we should do in response. He makes these similarities, though, more important for us in verse 30. He says, For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience. So they too have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may now receive mercy. Now, I know that feels like you're going to have to have a flow chart to trace Paul's argument, but let me try to make this clear, right? He's making similarities between Israel's salvation and the salvation of us. He's saying, you were disobedient, but now you've received mercy through a Jewish Messiah. Israelites, they're now being disobedient by denying Christ. And that's the reason the message of salvation has moved towards you as Gentiles. You are interdependent on one another. Your fates are knit together. And this is the mercy of God toward you collectively together. Now, through this expression of God's mercy, he's going to repeat the same pattern with the Israelites that he did formerly with the Gentiles. He is going to show mercy to the disobedient. That's what he says in verse 32. God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. The question is, who's the all here? Right? All of us, Jew and Gentile alike, have experienced disobedience. We've been consigned to disobedience. Right? We've been left in the results of our sin, not so that something would be, we would be left out or cut out, but so that he would show mercy to every people group on the earth. This is an amazing statement of God's mercy, and it helps us to recognize the common ground of our salvation, that, that all of us are only here as a result of God's mercy. There is no individual or people group that is here as a result of what we've done or what we deserve or, uh, or something that we're entitled to, but simply because God is merciful. And because of that, there's no person or people group out there who is outside of God's mercy. Right? We are all commonly in need of God's grace. This verse, if you had it by itself, right? he may have mercy on all, uh, may lead some people to think, well, does that mean that just everyone is saved? It's sometimes called universalism. And a lot of universalists hang a lot of meaning on this verse, right? He's consigned all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Maybe that means that, that everyone in the end will be saved. I suppose if this is the only verse you had in the Bible, maybe you could sort of twist it to say that. But we, we've been studying Romans together all year. Like, is, that, is that what the rest of Romans has taught? No, not at all. Instead, it's taught us repeatedly that all of us need to express our own faith in Christ, right? We, we all need to put our own trust in Christ in order to experience salvation. If you've never done that, or maybe you've done that recently and you've never expressed that publicly, baptism is next week, and we would love for you to demonstrate your faith in Christ by being baptized. All right, last thing before we close here. You know, I, I sort of mentioned at the start 
Theology can sometimes have a, a heady effect on us, right? Talking about big things like this, rather than causing us to, to celebrate the goodness of God, can cause us to think much of ourselves. And, and Paul, in these last couple of verses, helps to give us a good model of how to respond to that. He responds to salvation with humility and with worship. Verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. This on its own is a fascinating sentence, or it's a, it's a beautiful sentence. But in light of what Paul has just talked about, it's a remarkable model of humility, isn't it? You know, he's just talked about things nobody knows about the future of humanity, right? Paul has been shown things by God that, that none of us were shown, and he's, he's revealed them, revealed this mystery to humanity. If anyone deserves to sort of take a bow, you'd think it's Paul. But Paul in this moment demonstrates Christian maturity and says, there's so much I don't know, so much I don't understand, and yet I put my trust in God. Uh, here's how one New Testament scholar described it. Paul could have searched the scriptures night and day, but his rigorous study never would have figured out what God intended in Christ. It had to be revealed to him. God's election and mercy have been manifested in history in ways no human could anticipate and few would appreciate. We see in a mirror dimly. We can barely make out what God has done in the past. We're often aware, unaware of what God's doing in the present, and we cannot foresee what God will do in the future. I read that this week, and I thought, man, that's such a dose of cold water. But isn't it true? We're... We're so often unaware of what God is doing. How unsearchable are his judgment and how unscrutable are his ways. And then Paul quotes from two Old Testament uh, passages where this is really true. One's from Job, it says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? And then from Isaiah, Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Why is he quote from Job and Isaiah? Like, these statements are true in and of themselves, but when you look at them in, in the context of their Old Testament passages, you know, Job is the story of someone who thought they knew what was right, only to realize they didn't see as God saw. Isaiah is the story of a prophet who realized God is doing more in his generation than he could have ever thought possible. For both Job and Isaiah, their testimony is to saying, we don't know all that God is doing. Um, there's a this is not to discourage us from study. This is not to discourage us from trying to figure out what the Bible says. But it's rather to respond, like Paul does here, not with a sense that we've got it under control, but that God has got it under control. That's why he says in verse 36, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This posture of I trust in God when I don't see is at the core of the Christian life, right? We, we trust in God even when we don't see what we need to do. Um, decades ago, there, there was a woman named Florence Chadwick who became the first woman to swim from Catalina to the coast here, just here, a block from here. And uh, she was an amazing long-range swimmer. She'd swum the British Channel. Uh, she'd swim other very long distances that none of us here could do. Um, and so she tried to swim the 26 miles from Catalina to the California coast which um, I don't even like going on a boat that far, so I don't know how she did it. And it was a, as she started, it was a 15-hour day. Um, she, got, uh, she got started, and then the fog kind of rolled in. And after 15 hours, she couldn't see where she was. She couldn't see anything around her. And she was, was getting ready to give up, and she tried one more hour. She was like, I, I just can't. I don't know. I don't know where I am. I, I got to stop. It's too painful. It's too cold. I'm too tired. So she got in the boat, and she found out... Uh, as the boat that was trailing her headed in, she had only been a mile left from the shore. Right? And she said, you know, I think if I could have seen the coast, I could have made it. But I couldn't see, and so I gave up. And that's a, it's an inspiring quote because it makes us think, man, if we could just see what was in front of us, if we could just see where we were heading, then we wouldn't give up our faith. Right? We, we would trust that God is, is good. If we could just see what was in front of us, then we would make it. And the problem, of course, is that our lives have more fog than the California coast, right? We, we, we don't get a sea, right? We're, we're left like Florence Chadwick, not knowing how much further we have to swim or how much is left. Well, a few months later, Chadwick tried again. She tried a second time to do the swim. Uh, and this time, you'd think I would say it was a clear day. She could see the coast. She could make it the whole way. And that was the difference. It was actually a foggier day the second time. But she made it because she said, I kept in my mind a picture of the coast the whole way. Right? I kept in my mind a picture of the coast the whole way, and that's why I made it. 
I think that's a really beautiful way to describe what you and I need to do with our faith in Christ, right? We, we don't get to see the coast. We don't get to see what's in front of us. Even when there's these mysteries that are revealed in Scripture, they're, they're inscrutable and un, they're uh, unsearchable. They're beyond our understanding. But we can trust in the one who holds the future. We can trust that he is faithful and we can hold on to him when the life is foggy. And I know that for some of you, that is really a, a heavy burden right now because life is really foggy for you and things are really hard right now. And, and all I can say is that God is faithful that he is trustworthy, and that he is good. Now let's close our time in prayer. God, I am grateful for the chance uh, to open your word together as a people this morning and to be reminded of your faithfulness and your goodness. God, we confess that so often uh, we want to know the future for our own ends, not to glorify you, but to make much of ourselves. God, we pray that as we reflect on what you have done and what you will do, it'll lead us to trust you more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.